recording. I'm Aditya, a researcher with the Ethereum Foundation, and I'll be conducting the session. Uh, so Vlad is going to start the session with uh, a few lines on charting philosophy. So, you know, let's uh, welcome him then. So I'm just here to set the scene a little bit for Aditya's talk uh, on sharding um, and to kind of explain some of the, or like the basic philosophical difference between sharding in CBC Casper research and sharding in Ethereum 2.0 and most other sharding protocols in the space. The main kind of difference is that we regard sharding to be entirely within the consensus protocol problem definition. So consensus protocols are protocols where that allow nodes to make consistent decisions in a distributed network. But normally, you know, we imagine that, they're, that that means that they're making the same decision. In sharding, however, we, what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna somehow try to make consensus protocols scale by weakening that condition and allowing them to make consistent decisions on different parts of some state. So normally, consensus protocols, you know, we have like, like a binary consensus protocol decides on a bit. Um, a blockchain consensus protocol decides on a blockchain. A sharded consensus protocol somehow decides on a sharded thing, which means something that is made of more than one part. So a, a binary consensus protocol fundamentally can't be sharded. It's just like impossible to shard a binary consensus protocol because it's impossible to have decisions that are consistent on different values in a, in a binary consensus protocol. And it's also impossible to get any scalability out of that because the, rec the information required to decide on a bit over here and decide on the same bit over there is like the same information. Whereas what we need for scalability is for the decision the information required, the mess protocol messages required to make a decision over here in this part of the state. It should be much less than the information required to make all of the decisions that the consensus protocol can make everywhere. And this is just not possible for a binary consensus Why? protocol. So a sharded consensus protocol is a consensus protocol that has consensus on some, some big kind of state with different parts where the nodes that make decisions only need a, a, a relatively small amount of protocol messages, a relatively small amount of information to make only the decisions that they're interested in. So um, this kind of varies somewhat from the traditional or like the more easy to grok sharding approach where you have like one consensus protocol that's not scalable and then you have shards that kind of notarize into that consensus protocol and that where we use that this protocol is kind of reason about the some the, somehow not quite native to the consensus protocol decisions that are hanging off of it. And so, what Aditya is going to go through is a lot of stuff, but um, it, I think going to feature a lot of conversation about the four choice rule that is you know uh, possible to use in this way by clients using a consensus protocol, where basically they'll be able to evaluate kind of part of the four choice rule, only the part that's relevant to the decisions that they're interested in on the particular shards that they're interested in. And in the CBC Casper consensus protocol uh, family, there's a separation, you know, of the distributed systems considerations, and this thing called an estimator, which maps protocol states to consensus values. Um, and it, this is kind of the, the place where the four choice rule goes. You know, the four choice rule takes your current state and figures out like one for it. It's not really the distributed systems component. And we'll spend most of today talking about the four choice rule, which is going to fit inside this kind of consensus protocol, um, and which is a distributed system that provides consistent decisions on consensus values. In this case, we're going to be specifically providing decisions on little pieces of an overall very large consensus value. And so in this way, kind of we get scalability entirely inside the normal consensus protocol definition. Um, so, you know, sharding for me, and philosophically, is about scaling consensus protocols, which mean, which are about making consistent decisions. Um, and, you know, scaling basically means that we make decisions about the things we're interested in, you're doing only much less work that is required to make all of the decisions. Um, and this kind of contrast from the Ethereum 2.0 thing, because somehow if you're doing, if you're syncing up with the beacon chain, then you're somehow getting all the information required to make all the decisions, approximately, as far as the four choice rule is concerned. Um, and, and so I think, you know, hopefully that provides like some context for the conversation and for you know, some ways in which CBC Casper sharding is going to be different than Ethereum 2.0 sharding. And with that, please welcome Adit.
All right, so I think we should get through this presentation rather quickly. So uh, they gave me one and a half hour. I think this, sh this slide should be done in 40 minutes. So if you do have a question about the particular slide, please do stop me. But if it's something more general, I request that you wait till the end. So the outline goes something like this. I'll describe some of the you know, main features of the CBC sharding design, uh, some discussion on why it's better, uh, or how it's an extension of existing sharding solutions, and then some open problems that uh, we have with this proposal. So, you know, uh, of course we, we want to come up with a sharded blockchain and a scalable blockchain, and we know that there is something called a scalability dilemma. Uh, for those of you who don't know this, uh, you can consider it uh, as a triangle, and each of these vertices represents uh, some desirable property that we want from our system. So scalability, decentralization, and security. What do these mean? Well, um, scalable meaning that the entire system as a whole is able to process a large load. Decentralization meaning uh, no single validator in this network or in this system is having to handle a load that corresponds to more than one shard or something like that. What this means is there is no requirement for a super node which uh, processes all transactions everywhere or you know some, some sort of weird uh, assumption where there's a node which sees all messages or something like that. Because we want uh, you know consumer hardware, hopefully, to run each of these validator nodes and not some mining firm, some mining firm somewhere in Asia. Um, and secure meaning all shards enjoy the same level of security. So it shouldn't be the case that you know baking security in one shard is super easy, but then other shards are really secure and have, have great safety properties. And hopefully, as a desirable, we have that the security in each shard is as strong as consensus safety across all nodes for some good consensus protocol of our choosing. And so I'm going to assume that uh, you're, you guys are fairly familiar with the ETH2 proposal. I'll use that as a reference to help you understand the CDC sharding design. And so over here in this shard, uh, in this sharded system, we have one beacon chain at the top and a number of shard chains that are a child of this beacon chain. In the e uh, in the CBC design, it looks a little bit like this. So it's structurally different. Uh, you have a shard tree that has a bigger depth. It can be uh, it can be an arbitrary shard tree of any any depth of your choosing. And uh, well, this is structurally fundamentally different than than ETH2. So the main highlights of the CBC sharding design are going to be, in, with respect to the four choice, not the consensus, are going to be the cross shard messaging system and a hierarchical sharding design. So the main features of any sharding solution are determined by how cross shard transactions get through. So it's fairly easy to come up with you know, a sharded blockchain, which is in fact just independent chains running on their own and no kind of interaction between two chains. So for example, take, take Zilliqa. It's a, an early sharding solution, which looks rather primitive now, where it runs in phases. So there's a sharded phase where shards process transactions that occur within themselves. And then you stop sharding, and there's a phase called process all transactions. So you know, this is just to highlight that the way you handle cross-shard message, cross-shard transactions really determines the features of your sharding system. And well, hierarchical sharding is a different way to organize your shards. And as we'll see later, arguably, it allows for better modularization of the shard space. Right, so cross-shard messaging system. So let's look at what the workflow for Ethereum 2 is today. Uh, we have one parent chain, which is the beacon chain, and child C1 and child C2, which are both shards. And we are trying to get a message from C1 to C2. Um, so the first thing that happens is some user in C1 uh, produces a transaction in that shard. Then uh, it goes into the beacon chain, and that's handled by the protocol, meaning that there's some crosslink committee that 
aggregates all the messages that are supposed to go to the beacon chain and puts it into the beacon chain. And the last part to happen is some user on C2 uh, makes that chain aware of the existence of such a cross-chain transaction. And it points, it refers with the shard to the, the specific receipt on the pen. With, with, with the CBC cross-shard workflow, the first part is rather similar. User initiates a transaction on the first shard. Uh, the protocol handles the delivery of that message to the parent. Uh, but then this last part is quite different. And what we are aiming for is that the protocol itself handles the delivery of this cross-shard message from the parent to the other chain. And what this really allows us to do is give the user an experience of a single transaction on one shard behaving as or appearing as if it's a, a, a real cross-shard transaction going from one shard to the other without any additional input from the user. So let's let's look at this cross-shard system a little bit more deeper. So messages are going to be objects that contain the sender shard, uh, the, the destination shard, uh, the target block in the destination shard, and the blocks to the value. These last two things I'll describe in the next slide. And we also assume that blocks in shards are going to contain logs of messages that are sent and then received. So we, 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 we maintain lists of what we have sent and what we have received. And so let's consider two shards, shard A and shard B. And shard A is sending uh, a cross-shard message to shard B. So the message originates from here, meaning that it's in the sent log of this block in shard A. And the message says, my target block in shard B is this. So the target block tells you the starting point from which the other shard can receive your message. And the blocks to live value is something like this. So here the blocks to live value is two. What it means is this message can be received in the other shard, starting from this block up to two blocks later, if the blocks to the value is two. This is kind of puts a restriction on where the message can be received in the, in the destination shard. And we really want to preserve, uh, we really want to make this sending and receiving of messages quite consistent across shards. So we have an atomicity condition, which says that a message that appears in the send, uh, a message should appear in the sent log in the sender shard, and eventually uh, the received log in the recipient shard. Oops. And if, oops. So a message should appear in the sent log of the sender shard and eventually the received log of the recipient shard or it should appear nowhere at all. So it's either sent and delivered or it's it's not sent at all. Oops. You just hold that. <laughs> Are you starting a drum back? Well, I guess that could work. Okay, so if we analyze this condition more closely, um, it means that we, we want a liveness property which says messages sent but not received are eventually received. And the safety property is that only messages that are sent are going to be received. So it, it, we, we don't want it to be the case that some shard receives a message that no other shard has sent. Something like message appearing out of nowhere that no one initiates. Um, and we, we actually enforce this atomicity condition using the four choice rules of the shard. And it's also dependent on what the shard hierarchy is. So, yeah. I just want to mention um, that this safety condition is at, at finality. So it could be that in the four choice rule at a particular moment, you know, it's, it could be sent but not received. But it'll never be finalized that it was sent and not received. So like you'll never have an atomicity violation be final. Even though there could be a moment in the four choice rule while it's making some changes where there is an atomicity violation. Sure, and hence the eventually. Yeah, look, although, 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 really quick, Chris. So if it's, if it's never received, does, does the sent get deleted? Yeah, exactly. So, so there's, there's, are you going to talk about this no, one? 
Um, so, the way, so the way that this works, is it, and there's two versions. One of them is when the parent starts communicating with the child, in which case the child will orphan the blocks that didn't receive it in time, if that parent still has the send in their fork, fork choice. And the other version is when the child is sending to the parent, in which case the child will orphan the block that sends it if the parent doesn't receive it. So the child kind of follows the parent. And so when there's an atomicity failure, it's always because the child has a send that the parent hasn't received, as opposed to vice versa. Okay. All right, there's, there's more on your question in the next yeah. slides. Oh. Okay. Right, so we enforce these, these constraints by the four choice. And similar to each two, what we have is that the shard chain four choice is actually determined by the four choice of the parent. But here it's, it's more general. Uh, because you can have multiple children and in, in for a particular shard. So um, any child shard blocks that are referenced in the parent's four choice, either by the virtue of a send from the parent to the child, or the parent receiving a message from a particular block in the child, are going to remain in the child's four choice. And this is the condition we enforce. So the first case is you know the parent sending a message to a child. So if in this block in the parent, there is a message uh, which says this is the target block in the child. Then everything up till here, up till this block, is going to remain in the child's fork choice. And the other case is where the parent receives a message uh, from the child which originates from this block, which means the parent kind of references this block in the child. So we enforce the condition that the child fork choice always includes this block. And, and, and so that, that I hope answers your question. If the parent receives a message, uh, it's always going to be sent in the child's four choice. And if it's the other way around, uh, the parent sent a message to the child, then the other child block is going to be in the four choice. If the parent originally sent a message to the child, and then you know that, that block got forked out of the parent's four choice, then the corresponding child block which receives it also gets forked out. Because we don't want it to be the case that a child is, is receiving a message that was never sent from the parent. So the parent fork choice is quite independent of the child, except for a few restrictions that are like, self-imposed because of the way the parent fork choice behaved in the, in the past. So for example, you can't have uh, the parent, let's say in the past, sending to one fork of the child and then later receiving from another fork of the child. Because here, with this first message, the parent instructs the child to always keep this block in its fork choice. And then later on, uh, with, with the other message that it's receiving from a conflicting fork, it's asking the child to always keep that, that block in the fork choice. But these are actually incompatible blocks. So those are uh, restrictions on the parent fork choice that we impose. And you know, that's all nice and we have this four choice and messages getting around to different shards, but how do they actually get there? Uh, well, we, we, it's, it's not, you know, it's not, a, it's not the internet where you can just say, I send a message to the other guy. There's, there's no guy at the other end, it's a shard. So who are we really sending messages to? <coughs> so let's see how messages actually are passed from one shard to the other. So. Let's consider the case of two shards, a parent and a child, and we are trying to get, oops, um, and let's look at how validators are arranged in these shards. So let's say there's a validator on the child shard. The condition that we impose is if you're a validator on the child, you are also a validator on all of its ancestors. So what it means here is that uh, this guy also has to validate the parent chart. And let's see if we are trying to make this, this cross-chain message happen uh, from the child to the parent. So a user initiates some transaction on the child. The, the, the specific validator sees that message. It retrieves it from the child chart and then puts it in the mempool of the parent chart. And hopefully, you know, if there's liveness between this cross-chart route, then that parent received picks it up from the mempool, and then puts it in one of its blocks. So, and the other way around is also quite similar. 
how, how about how messages get from parent to the child. And this actually allows us to do really complex routing, routing functions. So for example, if we have this kind of a situation where you have a parent and children C1 and C2, and we are trying to make a message get from C1 to C2. So let's look at how the validator sets our arranged here. Um, so we have a validator on C1, who is also a validator on the parent because of the way, uh, because of the rules we impose on validators. Um, and on the other on the other side, it's going to be the same thing. If you are a validator on the other child, you also have to be a validator on the parent. And we are trying to make this uh, cross chain message go through. So it appears in the in the chain of C1. Uh, Goku picks it up from C1, puts it in the parent, and then Vegeta picks it up from the parent and places it in the other child. And this, this really allows you to make complex routing functions happen because with hierarchical sharding, you can arrange your shard tree pretty much as you like. So let's look at some prototypes that we have built in the past. So maybe some of you have seen this animation on Twitter. So what this really means is there is a parent shard, there is a child shard. These green horizontal lines are uh, the, the blockchains of the shards. So, and, and these boxes um, over here are actually blocks. These vertical lines are messages going through. So let, let's wait for it to reset. Right, so you can see messages getting from the child to the parent. And well, if you look closely, then it also orphans messages that were once sent but never received, or, or once received by the child but then got forked out from the parent, and so on. And the interesting thing is, because uh, this is all four choice based, you can also change the hierarchy of the shards. So here's an example where uh, shard zero and shard one are actually switching their parent-child relation. So th what, what these prototypes show is this, this thing is not complete bullshit and some of it actually works. Uh, Yep. And we, we can even go one step further and make an arbitrary shard tree like this with, with seven shards and change the hierarchy pretty much arbitrarily as we like. And it still works. And it doesn't disrupt routing. Yeah. <laughs> and if you want to find out more about this cross chain mess cross shard messaging system, uh, there's a neat research post made cross shard messaging system that you can read. Um, and you know, now let's let's take a look at hierarchical sharding and what advantages it has. There's, there's also on the GitHub slash CVC dash Casper uh, proof of concept implemented. So you can also, if you have a lot of will to read software, take a look at that. It's not that bad. I think it should be okay to read if you like reading software. So this is a depiction of each two. And let's say the two contracts people care about most are MakerDAO and Uniswap, and they exist on this shard. Which shard would you make your account on? Well, you know, if, if these are the two contracts you care most about, you're gonna to want to make it on this shard so that every other transaction you make doesn't have to be a cross-shard transaction. And I'm sure there are some really popular accounts, uh, really popular contracts that everyone wants to be in the shard. <coughs> So with, with hierarchical sharding, we can actually well, alleviate this problem a little bit, not completely, is um, we kind of provide equal access to the most popular contracts by placing them in the root. So any account on any of these shards has equal access to these accounts on the root. And also, let's say there are some you know, less popular, less, less popular contracts like Compound, you put them on shards on depth one, and everyone in this subtree has 
uh, has equal access to these accounts. So anyone who cares about MakerDAO, but not Compound, will want to exist on the on on this sub these subplays, but not that one. And so this kind of depicts how you can modularize your shard space better. So open problems in this design. Well, um, I think the biggest concern is the message load that that is put on the root shard. Uh, because most of these cross-chain messages are going to be have, have to be routed through the root, which means that the validators on the root shard, which is everyone, has to process these. So, you know, if, we, if you want to consider this example where, let's say, cross-shard messages account for 10% of the entire system board, and 5% of cross-shard messages are uniform. And uniform here meaning occur between randomly chosen pairs of accounts. Um, well, then, if you have a binary shard tree, well, I mean, meaning the root has two children, left and right, then, you know, and accounts are equally distributed between left and right, then this 5% uniform uh, cross shard messages are going, it's, it's going to be divided by two for uh, the number of messages flowing through the root. So 2.5% of all messages are going to go through the root. And this actually corresponds to, since, since the cross shard messages account for 10% of the system load, there's 0.25% uh, of the total system load is going to be the burden in the root shard, which, which, which puts a fundamental limit on the scalability you can have because of the decentralization uh, desirable that we have, that each validator should not have to process the load corresponding to more than one shard. Uh, the 0 0.25 number here corresponds to a 400 times scalability. But, uh, well, this example is rather skewed because we really shouldn't be assigning probabilities to things we don't know the behavior of. So we, we really don't know how this distribution behaves. So it's just a depiction, but uh, nowhere, nowhere accurate. So the f a few possible solutions for this are uh, well, you do some sort of ETH2-esque uh, design where you come to consensus on only the roots of these cross-shard messages. You, you aggregate them in, in some structure and only come to consensus on the roots of these messages. So you don't put the actual messages in, in shards. You put the roots of aggregated messages. And you make the pre-image available in, in some other way. So you can put it on some chain like Lazy Ledger, which is which means that everyone downloads all of all of the data, or everyone downloads the parts of the parts of data that they are interested in, but not everything. So that kind of reduces the load on consensus. Uh, or we can come up with some sort of da data availability games to make messages sent by one shard uh, available in another shard, but without putting it in in in, in their bed. Well, the other problem is load balancing across shards. So as I mentioned earlier, hierarchical sharding allows you to modularize your shard space better. But meaning that you can you can place most popular contracts on the root. But then how do we decide which are the most popular contracts? There is a high social cost to placing contracts on the root shard because then all validators have to keep track of its state. It's going to be replicated by all the validators. So there is a high social cost to it. And we need to decide um, how we place things in, in this sharded system and where do we place things. So that is an open problem. Um, I guess uh, this is probably the last slide, which says, how do we do validator set rotation across depths? So let's say, let's consider a validator who only wants to validate this shard. So the guy only has to keep a track of the shard at depth one and the parent. So, so you have to validate two shards and you can get away with having a, you know, some, some small hardware. You don't, maybe you don't need industry grade hardware for it. But for someone who wants to validate this uh, left, left uh, path, uh, he's, that, that guy is going to have to keep a track of three shards. And maybe it takes, you know, 
industry level hardware to do that. So we need to maintain different classes of validators in our validator set that correspond to different hardware. And we need to come up with a way to do validator set rotation across it. One of the solutions to do this is you have a static uh, complete binary tree of a certain fixed depth to do this. And you know you just assign validators to leaves. But it takes away the, the dynamic shard tree structuring that you can do. So why can't you change the structure of a tree with bounded depth and just while keeping the depth always bounded? Like imagine the depth is max 10. Why can't we change from an arbitrary tree of depth 10 to an arbitrary tree of depth 10 without ever going through a tree of depth 11? Um, well, you can, but you, then you can't make any... Well, I guess you can, but I'm sure there's only some transitions that you can do, and not all. Okay. okay, that's it for the presentation. Um, I guess we can open up for questions. I wanted this to be more of an interactive session, so we can take questions for a long time. Hey, hey th thank you very much. Very, very, very good presentation. I want to ask in that example of the MakerDAO contract being in, in, in the root, like, let's assume that's really popular, but isn't like, the, the maximum throughput of that MakerDAO contract in terms of the transaction still limited to the capacity of a single shard? Like, how, how is the MakerDAO ever be able to do more transactions than that, or is that? Is that not possible? Um, yeah, that's true. Uh, or, yeah, that's uh, that seems fine though because, well, let's say these you only put the most popular contracts on the root chart, so there is no other load that the root chart has to bear. Right. I think F two would have the same problem though. You have to, if you wanted to run based out transactions in parallel, you need to spin up two different contracts and let them run. Together. Yeah, the question is sure, you could you could shard that contract yeah, as well if you so want. You'd you have to do it like you'd probably make two of them, right? Yeah, you, you make you make as many as you want. Level. Yeah. So if you're bounded by let's say TPS and it's you can shard that contract fairly easily, you just have multiple copies of that for each shard subtree or something. Yeah. Okay. That's not, that sounds a bit like a recursive problem, right? Because MakerDAO itself tries to keep balances and consensus. So right, if you shard it, then you need to have the consensus. Like you shard yeah. it again or something? It, it doesn't seem like that. You might run into the problem where if you want to have a, a like a, a single ledger parallelizing it, it's like you want to have like one balance yeah. so you can just parallelize it. That I mean, I, I just wanted to check that I understood. I mean, it, with this construction, basically, make a doubt just has the capacity of one shard, right? That's it. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. But but in any sharded system, any single smart contract existing on one shard has the scalability limit of that shard. Okay. I mean, that's a fundamental yeah. issue in all sharded systems. Sure. Okay. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, so, my understanding was that the cross shard shard messages are asynchronous, right? Um, and well, yeah. asynchronous in what sense? By With respect to the fork choice, no. But I, I guess, like, if, I guess what I'm wondering is, like, if I was to run, like, uh, you know, a like I have my smart contract and it wants to interact with MakerDAO. Um, if I'm in the same shard as MakerDAO, mm -hmm. can I do sort of like a asynchronous, okay. so, you know, so call makes, in, in the same right. So this makes no claims about how the execution environment, execution layer is going to be. I'm not sure if you can compose smart contracts with using these smart using these cross shard transactions or not. Right. So I'm not sure how the execution layer uh, plays with this. We, we have had some proof of concepts with this for asynchronous calls. Something like you just you just send out a function, you just call a function on the other shard that you don't ever expect to hear back from. Right. That's something you can definitely do. But I'm not sure how you handle it if you expect it to return some value to you or right. execute some function and get you back this or something like that. So, so the thing that this architecture provides is the cross shard messaging. It doesn't say exactly like what the semantics of the virtual machine will be, and like you know, for example, we send a, a call. Is your smart contract going to be frozen, or is it? Is it? Can anything re-enter? Uh, and then, uh, but then it'll continue after like the, you know, the uh, like as if you know, as if concurrency works like reentrancy today. 
or whether like the smart contract would just kind of be frozen and wait for the transaction to be over. Like all of these things are implementable in the same communication model it, it, from the point of view of the sharding, even though from the point of view of the smart contracts communication model will be quite different. And so I think and hope that we'll explore different models for smart contract communication and see what people like. <coughs> Um, and try to support many of them because you know it shouldn't make a difference to the sharding architecture. You know, at least not at the level of the four choice rule. Yeah. So, so how do you decide on the on the, on the topology of the two? Like, who who is deciding on that? Uh, well, I'm not sure. I am. I am. <laughs> the, the load balancer, the load balancer decides. I mean, the load balancer needs to figure out uh, what should go where in order to maximize the throughput and minimize the overhead of the, the system. Some things need to be closer to each other because they communicate more often. Some things be less often and should be further away from each other. So basically, it's the load balancer's responsibility to balance the shards and to figure out, you know, how it can minimize the load of communication minimize the latency of communication. There's actually a number of goals that the load balancer has to achieve, and it's, it's the load balancer's responsibility to make sure that the shard hierarchy is useful for the particular virtual machine um, configuration that people are, are going with, or that, people, that the users are, you know, um, I don't know what the word is. The behavior the users are creating through their aggregate act activity. So, can you change over time? Like, yeah, absolutely. So, so, the, so this this uh, GIF actually depicts a changing shard hierarchy. So, I think one example of, of load balancing would be let's say there's some there's some contract X Y Z here, and it turns out lots of people are using X Y Z, and the load in these two and they all exist here, uh, but none of them use compound too much but none of them use what's on this shard too much, then it makes sense to attach another shard which is a child of this guy, but not here, because you need it to be close to this. So efficient clustering is the, a, a problem that the load balancer will solve. So when you explain what is the load balancer, is it a smart contract, and if so, where does it apply, where does it I'm not sure if it's a, it should be a smart contract or it should be handled in the protocol, but it's something that that kind of efficiently clusters frequently used accounts together. Okay, so it's got, a, but it's got a, uh, exist in every in every layer. Yes, and it needs some information about what's going on in its neighborhood as well. Yeah. So that that's actually a topic of ongoing research. Uh, we are not sure what the best way to go about it is, but there are a, a couple of couple of strategies out there. The so parents can also create new shares. Uh, sorry, what? The load balancer can also create new shards? Yeah, I guess the load balancer instructs when to create new shards and what to place in the new shards and so on. So, so basically there's a number of shard rotation operations. You know, you can like, move a child to up a, layer, up a level so that it's now a sibling of its parent. You can move um, uh, uh, one of the children to be the children of one of the children. Um, and, and, and there's one more operation where the root shard changes, which is like a different operation. If the root swap, the root shard swaps with one of its children. It can't really, there's no other way to get rid of the root shard other than to swap with one of the children. And so there's these three basic operations which are enough to, to go from any shard architecture with n shards to any shard architecture with n shards. And the load balancer basically has this, these operations as its interface that it's going to use to change the structure of the system. Um, and yeah, it can also destroy and, uh, and create shards, but you can't destroy or create the root shard or any shard with children. You can only destroy and create shards when they don't, you can only destroy shards when they don't have children. Um, and so, you know, th with those operations, we can, the load balancer that has like an interface to those operations can be specified to do any of these changes. Does it mean as a validator I should actually try to get the new shard like Apollo because of things like uh, rebalancing that would happen? And then try to catch up like get with the data? Uh, I, I mean, I'm not sure if the validators run this load balancing function. No, no, but as a validator, should I follow like and say that there is a new shard? Yeah, I think so. I think that would, that would, I think load balancer, uh, 
well, no, there would be a separate validator set rotation function that tells you where you're supposed to be validating. Yeah, good. Would you say there would be a deterministic rule balancing for the whole system, or a deterministic rule balancing for the efficient application is aware of everything? So, I mean, it is, it is hierarchical in, in the philosophical sense as well. So this guy is the parent of this subject. So the load balancer here determines what goes on in this subject. And the load balancer here pretty much determines what, what happens everywhere. But it is hierarchical. So the load balancer has to Yes. Yes, it does. It does happen. Yeah. Uh, for Vlad, uh, I'm curious what your thoughts are about like uh, our change or VM and like that if you think that that kind of model of like a virtual machine that's able to like handle multiple threads inherently would be better for this sharding model. Um, so this sharding model is independent of the virtual machine architecture, um, and so I don't think it's, it's really like the right like, level for the question. However, you know, uh, it might be useful for describing. So, so, the, so, so, so right now the way we're operating is we don't know anything about the semantics of the smart contracts at the level of the sharding. So it might be possible that if you give the load balancer more information by having concurrency information exposed, like readable from the virtual machine terms, that it could do a better job. But uh, at this level of the specification, we're not looking inside the smart contracts at all. And so it's not going to do anything. Um, and if you wanted to look inside the smart contracts to do this low, the load balancing, I mean, that would be really cool if you could, if you, if you have an edge, if you get an edge from that. But uh, I, I can't, I can't tell. Just a priority right now. Yeah. Okay. So is there a way to like you said you you have a block? I forget what you call it. Block to leave or on a message? On a message. You look at what the, uh, it's just something you have to determine. It's like the what the gas limit should be. But so there should be a limit. Oh, there should be a limit. If if you put that as infinity, what it means is your blocks can be received. So you the reason to have this is that let's say a child sends a message to its parent and the blocks to the value is two and the parent chain progresses beyond this, then you know that that message will never be received. Right? And then you fold that child out. Uh, you fold that block out in the child. If you set that value too high, then you're in an indeterministic inter state for too long. So you don't want it to be too high, and you don't want it to be too low because maybe the mempool doesn't yeah, process yeah. transactions that fast. But the validator of A doesn't know anything about child A. Doesn't know. No. So 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 if this is a child and this is a parent. Uh, child validators are also validators on the parent. So. They have a lot of information this way. And for parent to child, it's actually authoritative. If the parent says you have to receive this message, then the child has to receive a message. If, you know, this is the parent shard, and let's say this this was the latest block in the child, and blocks to levels two, then after, if this block does not receive the parent message, it's invalid. It is, it is authoritative that if a parent tells you to receive a message, you must receive it by its block to live value. So that means you must create a block by then that receives it. Otherwise, the block is just invalid. And how, what are the performance trade-offs with increasing um, the frequency of Understood otherwise. I think there's an overhead to the load balancing function in general because you have to figure out what the current like behavior of the network is. Assuming low balancing is instant. Sorry, so assuming... Uh, so you mean just reorganizing re the shard tree? Yes. Um, I think validator sets have to be reorganized because if you're, if you're shifting it to a different depth, then you need validators of a different class who have hardware that can validate shards at depth four instead of depth three. Uh, otherwise, you're limited to reorganizations of putting one shard into another place of the same depth. So definitely some trade-offs there, but I don't think we have thought about them yet. Yeah. Uh, 
how the validator is joining the shot? Is it just like a validator like sending a, like a deposit message or the complete like a shot and then like So we haven't specified that yet actually. Uh, there's, there's lots of existing research. E the E2 guys know how to do this. Uh, it seems like a standard way. Uh, it doesn't seem uh, anything too special. You, you know, so. Like why then two in this case? Like uh, why you are writing the two blocks before like... Oh, this was just an, just an example, just a depiction. It can be pretty much anything that you want. Yeah. I thought when it's two, it's because of the teaching of dynamic validator set. That's why I thought it's like... Oh, no, it's, uh, it's just a depiction. It's just a picture, yeah. It seems that marginal initial cost to be validating a child mm -hmm. the higher than Sorry, what? The marginal cost of validating mm -hmm. another child can be already validated. Right. Actually, would be cheaper. But if it's in the same path, yes. If it's a different path, then you, know, you, you, you need lots of other stuff. Yeah. A bit, bit related to my earlier question, but when I understand the load balancing correctly, basically the one who's most popular is like the guy who's getting most messages, right? Yes. And in, in some sense as well. So he's going to move up into the root, yes. go higher and higher. Yeah. But aren't you, then, because like the higher you are, the more children you have, right? Yes. So this guy is going to like receive it, tons of messages, right? The orders of magnitude with every step. Um, but, but I think it, the number of messages you receive doesn't depend on where you are in the shard tree. It's just a virtue of what your smart contract is. It, yeah, you're but also routing out the messages. <coughs> you're also routing, right? For different yeah. Stuff. So you are receiving more if you're up. Yeah, yeah, if you're up, you're skipping less actually because you go up only if. So. So you would move up from, let's say, this shard into this shard. Only if there's lots of users over here who are sending cross shard messages like this into your contract. So then you move it up here because you know that lots of people in this sub tree are, are trying to communicate with your contract. Yeah, then huh? To what extent do you find your CD2022 amenable or constraining to this model in terms of keeping balances? Um, So you know, let's say let's say that your ERC twenty contract is existing here, means that for any other shard to change the assignment of ERC twenties to addresses, you have to communicate with this shard. So it seems like it's natural for it to exist on this shard system. It's, it doesn't seem like anything breaks. Just to understand correctly, when you're when you're adding, you have a shard. Yeah, unless you want to split that shard. I'm not sure if, if, if that function makes sense, splitting a shard. Well, because I can just pick a private key until I get the shard I want. And then just... Well, it's not specified that you are assigned to shards based on your address. Well, whatever the metric is, it's free. I think the load balancer decides, decides what, what, what accounts exist on one shard. I definitely don't think it's safe to allow validators to choose where they validate. It's just like completely unsafe, in my opinion. Just like, just no, there's, it's just a, like you could just choose where to attack. You could like choose where to block the holding, choose where to like. So like the the notion that validators get to choose what shard they're on has never never even crossed my mind. I'm not even talking about validators. I'm talking about if I want to interact with their contracts more often. Then I'll just. Oh, you're talking about your account. Yes, your it's your account. Also, you don't get to choose where that is. The load balancer decides where your account well, goes. Well, once it does land somewhere, it's there forever. No, no, load balancer can lose it forever. Yeah, my contract yeah. for shard. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you don't even need to know what shard it's on. You make your transaction and it'll get routed to that shard. I don't care what it's on. I'll No, you won't care because the, at least in our model, like the way that I like it, is there's the same gas price everywhere. Like I don't, I'm really, really not interested in having different gas prices, different execution environments at all. I'm not one day. Um, to me, the, the natural model is the same gas price across all shards, same execution environments across all shards, you know, just like whatever Ethereum 1.x comes out with. That's my personal personal preference. You know, at the end of the day, this isn't just like up to anyone, but um, to me, like just as a matter of like safety, you know, and usability, like it shouldn't be that people get to target shards for price, performance, validation, or anything. Yeah, what about 
message congest in there. So if you like, if you're a parent, you get massive tons of messages mm -hmm. from three or more children. Like, is yes. there a priority between them or like, uh, or well, what happens if it's con congested? Well, I'm unsure at this point, but there, there shouldn't be a priority among which messages you choose. Uh, that is, that is a concern. That is an open problem. Uh, oops. Yeah, and then the, the possible solutions are you don't make message messages appear as is on the parent. You just put the root of aggregated messages on the parent, and then the the, the pre images of that root are available elsewhere. So that that reduces the load on the parent a lot. Yeah. Uh, what does it physically means that uh, some uh, message uh, leaves for several blocks? Uh, where is it uh, situated? Physically. So, well, uh, when I say blocks to live, it means you can receive this message within those many blocks. So it, it defines where you can receive the message. It doesn't. Well, what you can you maybe. Uh, what does it mean to receive the message? It means included in your received log in a particular block. What is a message? Can you just like can elaborate more on it? Well, a message is you know some object that has a payload. Maybe it's a transaction. Like I'm not sure like what it is. Like a state root or what? Like uh, sorry? Is it like a state root of the shard? Finalized state root or what is it? No. In this context, when I've been saying cross shard transactions, I mean them to be actual EVM transactions. And who is actually proving the validity of that? Like a like a, if malicious validator will bring a like. A, like a wrong message to the parent, how is going to be checked? Um, so I think be very similar to how ETH2 handles this, is that you have a committee delegated to your child, which signs off that these messages are in fact valid. So there is a finalization happening on a shard, what you have just said? Yes. Okay, so yep. then it's finalized, I'm assuming finalized checkpoint, which is actually a transition. Uh, I think you should be able to receive messages before they are finalized. Uh, it, as long as someone attests that these messages were in the full choice at the time. So also related to the blocks to leave. Hmm? It seems like so you you is going back because you don't uh, receive a message. Yeah, you you is uh, removing part of the chain maybe. Yes, the child yeah. just removing orphaning some of its blocks because. Some block in the parent was orphaned. Yeah. But you also you also commit that you're not going to remove more than you, you said that you commit that you're not going. No, the child has no such guarantee. Except that when it sees something on the parent finalized, it knows that none of those blocks can be orphaned, and hence you can come up with some sort of a limit as to up to what point your chain might be orphaned. I mean, the the blocks to live value doesn't actually put restriction on how far you should be reverting back. It's just so that um, there is a very specific range of blocks that you can receive the message in. It seems like you could have multiple messages that start at different places and each one of them will cause uh, orphaning, orphaning some blocks and because you orphan those blocks now you don't receive yeah, Another message that, 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 that happens for sure. So even if one message, uh, even if the child has received one message from the parent, yeah. that later gets orphaned in the parent, you you know you orphan everything that has happened since. Yes, but then Not, there could be another message that you off, you just orphaned. That yeah, but, but that's that fine because if course. it's still in the poor choice of the parent, you receive it in the other fork of the child. So you you only have to remove. The message that was orphaned from the parent uh, from your fork choice. All the others you can receive again in, in your other fork in the chart. Okay. Yeah. I want to know if um, one can signal sharding like to DNA as uh, we are the validators of our parents mm -hmm. as well as our par parents validate us and we have all those genes, all those information uh, in us. But uh, if we want to go back, we have to like stay, uh, go to our, to, to our parents and our system. 
Okay, that's interesting. That's something we, we haven't thought about, but that's that's a creative way to put it. Uh -huh. Does the blog still get influenced? Like, what you should say that to? Is that influenced by the width of the tree? Um, I don't think so. The blog still live is just some parameter you come up with. So at, at run time. We just set it like as low as you want, because then you get you get your thing quickly. No. So the, the parent might put it as low as you want, and the, you know the child is forced to receive it. But if the child sets a really low blocks to live, it might just you know end up in the parent's mempool, but never get processed, and hence the block. You is just that, have to orphan that send. Is that like something you include with your trend? Like each user is like, I want. Uh, yeah, with each message, live. it specifies a target block and the blocks to live. I mean, it's like, it, like in F trends, though, everyone chooses their own amount. Does everyone choose yeah. their own yeah. their own blocks to live? Or you know. Their clients choose it for them by looking at the current state of the network. I'm not sure. I would say that this is not specified at the moment. Um, you know, in our proof of concepts, we just use the content time to live. I don't think that I, I feel super duper 100 percent comfortable saying that like yeah, your smart contract will be able to choose the time to live for its message because that could potentially increase the overhead of the solution. However, it's definitely not a function of the width of the tree because the time to live only has to do with the amount of blocks that you have to be received by your parent or child. So only has to do with the, with the immediate neighbors. So if you have um, a, a wide tree and say you have like two in hops or whatever to, to, to go to the destination um, and back, so, uh, it's gonna take two end times time to live, you know, in, in some way latency to do that because for every hop you have the time to live. Yeah, so, so is it like for, for each, like it makes one hop kind of per block? Is that, is that the idea? Um, I mean, you might take a few blocks to be received, but um, it, it basically the, the idea is that we do optimistic execution of cross-shard transactions. And if everything goes well in the normal case, it all gets executed and finalized. Um, and you know, if, if, it, if, it, if, it doesn't, if it doesn't, things can be orphaned and reverted. Um, and so when you ask, and and and, and, in, in, and the time to live, you know, if it's like five, I mean, it could take five blocks to get in. And this is not m measured in the sending shard, but in the receiving shard. Um, so I, I don't know if it's really meaningful for the sender, you know, if it's, if it's, if it's, if it gets in in one block necessarily, because they're not going to get a message back for a while. Um, so no matter what, it's not like they're going to get it back in a block. You know, if they have a time to live, and there's say there's a callback right away, then there's it's going to depend on where where the parent puts a source on the child. So like whenever you send a message, you have to kind of say, oh, I'm sending it to this fork, and the time to live starts from that block. And so depending on when the, what where the parent puts that source, it might take longer. To come back to this show. Okay. Yeah, so I guess, I guess it's like it's a bit complicated. And there's like the range of times that it could take to for a message to get back uh, is much bigger the more hops you have to do. In a traditional message like uh, towards to the root, like uh, if it's stored in a shard, like uh, in yeah, it appears in every shard in the path. So it's stored in like a smart contract. No, it's stored in. That the block that receives each block has a log of messages that it sent and received. So just like you include transactions that happen in this block, you also include these sent and received messages. So does it mean that in each like uh, stage that I need to finalize the checkpoint to be able to move it like a forward or no? Okay. It, it, so you don't have to wait till finality. If it appears in your parent's fork choice, let's say if there's a block in your parent fork choice that sends you a message then you can receive it. You don't have to wait for a finality. But you entangle the four choices, right? You entangle four choices, yes. Is it possible for different parts of the network to have different views on the topology of the tree? Um, so that you accidentally send a message to a... a sure, so in system? this, in this um, prototype, actually, um, so I think shard three moves around now, or something like that. So. Even if the other part of the network isn't aware of the current position of that shard, it sends a message, and we, you, it doesn't know what the final destination is, and those messages just 
keep getting routed until they reach their destination. Uh, can, can new shards be created or, or removed? Um, so what would happen if a message was sent to a shard that doesn't exist? Um, Does that even make sense? I don't think we have dealt with removing a shard yet. Adding a shard seems fairly easy. Remo removing the shard seems much harder because of the concern you said. So we, we haven't thought about removing shards yet. Yeah. I guess if you had to remove shards, you basically keep a track of uh, you know what address you want that message to go to, and then just find where that address is in a different shard and route it there. So for this full choice loop, uh, we have a paper. Uh, so we, we have a CBC draft paper that came out last DevCon, and in the example section, we have a formal definition of this uh, sharding system. So it describes the four choices and uh, the consensus protocol in formal logic. But that's syntax. Oh, I'm not sure what that means. So like. For instance, what you're describing and some of the problems that arise, this could be a wild guess, but it seems to me that you may be able to model this as uh, a sheaf, basically, a sheaf corpus. And basically things like removing a shard are difficult because of the new condition of the corpus layers. And things like messages and you know recomposing shards and whatever are basically natural transformations. I know it's like complicated mathematics, but it feels to me that if you find a formal structure in which you can translate what you're trying to do, you find a formal structure that models faithfully what you're trying to do, then answering some of these questions just becomes akin to compute some stuff from those structures which are deeply understood like for model. That's interesting. I, uh, I think we'd love to know more about uh, the ideas that you have. But um, you know, even if we don't have those particular ideas, we do use formal methods in all of this from like the very, very start. And yeah. so you, you know, even if we're using unsophisticated tools, and we have to do a lot more work. You know, we still at least hope to get like you know the kinds of guarantees that maybe you know you hope to get from formal methods. Yeah, but what I was trying to say is that you know when you do formal methods, you can look at them as let's say, operational per semantics perspective. So you're saying, OK, I'm formally implementing this, so I'm sure that whatever I specified works. Mm -hmm. Or you can do it denotationally. And in that case, you are not really looking at formal methods for implementation, but to prove general properties about your system, which are global. Mm -hmm. uh, it's probably not useful from a practical point of view, but it's useful if you want to answer some conjectures. That's what I'm trying to say. Sorry. So. So, denotational semantics, and what's the other one? Uh, oper uh, operational. Op operational. Can you define these terms for us? Yeah, so operational is just like uh, you have, um, let's say, an algorithm, um, and basically you want to model how a machine executes that algorithm. So you basically model formally what happens step by step at a very like, low level, but when you basically like doing things in this way, you can be sure that everything gets executed exactly as you specified it. But obviously, this doesn't say like a lot about the global behavior of the specification. While the notational semantics is like saying, for instance, what I'm trying to do defines a precise algebraic object, and then you can prove theorems using algebra. So if you say this is not the case, clearly, but that this algorithm is actually giving you the definition of a group, and then you find out that a property like finality, say, means that this given subgroup in the group is normal, then you can just prove that that subgroup is normal in the group. And that's what the denotational method tells you. And it tells you nothing about how faithfully you are going to implement, it's telling you something about the properties of the letter of the algorithm, and maybe that would be useful. So is a, it's a, it's a type, so in the type is formula, 
interpretation and denotational? There are links between the notational and operational, but uh, I, if I understood correctly what you were saying is it's very rare to have this, like to have a way to go from the notational and operational. Actually, there is this super strong property that never happens where your denotational semantics is your operational semantics. But there are very, very, very few cases of very like super simple algorithms that satisfy the same. Can you give us a talk? <laughs> I want more. <laughs> are, you, are you giving a talk about this? No. Um, okay, well, next year. <laughs> <laughs> we have now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 I, I guess we can end the talk, and if anyone wants to discuss more, we can chat offline.